Welcome to video 17 in our series on tensor calculus. In video 9, we introduced the idea of a covariant basis. In this video, we're going to talk about its counterpart, the contravariant basis. We'll start by defining a new second rank tensor using the expression you see here. You'll recognize the Kronecker delta and the covariant metric tensor. What's new here is this expression. And you see that it is a second rank tensor because it has two indexes. And the indexes are in the upper position, which means that it possesses the contravariant property. You'll also recognize that what we have here is a multiplication of these two items. Uh, there's going to be three terms because of the dummy index. We say when we multiply these together that we're creating an inner product. So that's what creates the dummy index J. And when we multiply those together, we get the Kronecker delta. And that simply means that these two tensors would represent matrices that are the inverse of each other. Our new tensor is the multiplicative inverse of the covariant metric tensor because it produces what's equivalent to the identity matrix. OK, using this definition, we're now going to define what we refer to as the contravariant basis vector. Now, you'll recall that we said a basis is simply any set of three linearly independent vectors that can be used to create linear combinations. And that's why we can use the covariant basis vectors, because they are linearly independent. Well, it turns out that these newly defined vectors, these guys right here, are also linearly independent, which means that they can be used to create a basis equally well. Now, in the definition, you'll recognize this as the covariant basis vector. And this is just the new expression that we have defined here. So let's see what kind of properties we can discover about this new vector. And we'll start by uh, taking the dot product of our new vector, the contravariant basis vector. We're going to dot that with the covariant basis vector. And I will use the letter K for this. I've got to introduce a new index, because on the right-hand side, I'm going to repeat this, ZIJ and ZJ. And the reason I need a new letter is because I'm already using J as a dummy index here. And to keep the equation valid, I cannot duplicate J for any other purpose. It's got to be just used twice here in this term as a dummy index. So I need a different letter K like this. And of course, that introduces a new free index to this expression. The definition was just three terms because there was a single index. Now I have two free indexes. So this expression is now nine expressions. All right, but you'll recognize, I hope, that this is nothing more than the definition of our covariant metric tensor. So we can replace this expression with the contravariant metric tensor times the covariant metric tensor, like this. Now you'll recognize that this expression is simply what we have right here. Therefore, I can replace the expression simply with the Kronecker delta with the indices i and k. So what that means is that this relationship right here is just going to resolve to the Kronecker delta. And that means that in every case where i is not equal to k, the result has to be 0. And for a dot product, that means the two vectors have to be orthogonal or perpendicular to each other. 
So these two vectors will be perpendicular in every case except when i is equal to k. Now when i is equal to k, the product of these two, the dot product, has to be 1. That means as one of them gets larger, the other has to get smaller because their product is always 1. Therefore, we sometimes refer to these two vectors as being the reciprocal of each other. All right, let's move on to see what else we can discover. This time, let's take the dot product of our new vector with itself. So zi dotted with zk, like this. And again, I need the new letter for the same reason as before. We're going to start with our definition expression here. And we're going to dot this with a new vector with the new free index of k. Well, what do you recognize here? What you recognize here is that this expression is just this expression. Therefore, we can replace the expression with this. Our contravariant metric tensor simply multiplied by delta k j. It's not the order of the terms, by the way, that matters. It's the position of the indexes. So even though this is written in a separate order, we um, recognize i as the upper index here, k is the lower one. We do the same thing here. k is the upper, and j is the lower, like this. OK, well, now, hopefully, you recognize that the, um, the delta, the Kronecker delta function can absorb the j index. And that just leaves us with z, i, k. Now, one of the things we can always do in one of these expressions is we can rename the free indexes as long as we keep them unique. Therefore, I can re-express this equation as z, i, dotted to z, j, is equal to z, i, j. Okay, now this should look pretty familiar. It looks a lot like the definition of the covariant metric tensor, except that the indices are in the upper position. You'll remember that this was the definition of the covariant metric tensor. So it's interesting how these two basis vectors kind of mirror each other. In this case, this is the expression we use to actually define the covariant metric tensor. Here we derive this result. And uh, nonetheless, it's interesting how these appear to be totally symmetric with one another. And one final observation, you recall that we recognized because the dot product is commutative that it could be in either order, which means that this had to be a true statement, that the covariant metric tensor had to be symmetric. Well, the same is true up here for the same reason. We didn't stipulate that in the definition, but it turns out that it has to be that way because the operation of dotting two vectors is commutative. Uh, just as a side note, there is a theorem in linear algebra that says any two vectors, if any two vectors are the inverse of each other and one of them is symmetric, the other is symmetric as well. We didn't uh, stipulate that at the beginning, but it turns out it has to be that way in order for our relationships to work out like this. OK, last thing we want to do is to go back and remember that we use the definition of the covariant basis vector to create linear combinations. So we use it to recognize that we can express a vector as a linear combination that looks like this. And when we did, we used the covariant basis vector, and we had to multiply that by a contravariant component. Now, 
uh, in the case we've just done, we find that we can also express a linear combination, this time using the contravariant basis vector we have just defined this way. When we do, for the same reason that we ran into this condition, we have to include a covariant component to expand out the uh, linear combination. And finally, because this is an invariant, we find that we have to get the same result whichever way we represent this. So we can say it this way, that we can express it either way. And that means that these two expressions right here have to yield exactly the same result in the end. The covariant basis vector does not equal the contravariant basis vector, nor do the components equal each other, but the linear combinations will yield exactly the same result. All right, we'll break at this point. Let's go review our major takeaways for this video. And the first thing we did was to define a new second rank tensor called the contravariant metric tensor. It's this term. Now we define it as the matrix inverse of our covariant metric tensor. And that is to say that when we multiply these two together using rules of matrix multiplication, we'll get the Kronecker delta or the identity matrix. Now having defined that, we then used it to define a new item called the contravariant basis vector. And it's this. The contravariant basis vector is derived by taking the covariant basis vector and combining it with the newly defined contravariant metric tensor like this. And then we explored some of the properties of our new basis vector. We discovered that if we take the dot product of the contravariant basis vector with the covariant basis vector like this, we'll get the Kronecker delta. That is to say, that if i and k are not equal, this has to be 0, which means that these two vectors will be orthogonal to each other. When i and k are the same, then they will basically be reciprocals of each other because the result is going to have to be equal to 1. Now, on the other hand, if we take the uh, dot product of our contravariant basis vector, zi with zj, uh, we'll find that it results in our contravariant metric tensor. And the result of that is that we discover that this uh, newly defined metric tensor is symmetric. We can flip i and j just as we do for the covariant metric tensor. And finally, now that we have a new basis like this, we can use that basis to form linear combinations the same way we did with the covariant basis. So here we've taken the contravariant basis vector times a covariant factor and formed a linear combination and it will result in exactly the same vector over here as if we had done so with a covariant basis and a contravariant scalar factor. Now just to reiterate to make sure you understand this new vector does not equal the covariant basis vector and the scalar factor here does not equal this scalar factor. But the combination of these two together results in the same vector as this combination. So it's an alternate way of representing a vector, which is an invariant geometric object. Now in the next video, I'll take you through samples to show you what this new basis looks like in our sample coordinate systems.